Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello, we're ready to get started here tonight. I'd like to start by welcoming everybody to tonight's public forum. This is a meeting of the Board of Selectmen, Oak Bluffs, and this is specific to our Oak Bluffs Civil War Monument. We're here tonight at the request uh, of the NAACP, who has made two requests. One is to remove the fourth plaque from the Union statue, as well as the tablet on the ground, which commemorates the placing of that plaque. Number two is to donate the plaques to the Martha's Vineyard Museum, who have relayed that they are receptive to this donation. With that said, I'm just going to run through the agenda so everybody understands the format that we'll be working within this evening. We're calling the meeting to order now. Uh, we are then going to have a historical perspective presentation by Mr. Bo Van Riper. From the, he is the research librarian from the Martha's Vineyard Museum. We'll then have some brief remarks from Carrie Tankard, uh, representing the NAACP, and Eric Blake as president of the NAACP, uh, and we'll follow up uh, Carrie Tankard. And we will then move on to public comment and discussion, which we've allotted about one hour plus minus four. And after that, at 7.30, we will close the public hearing if everybody's had an opportunity to be heard and we will deliberate as a board and hopefully attempt to come to some sort of resolution here tonight. So with that said, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bo Van Riper and he'll be up here at the podium to speak. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. It says research librarian on my badge, but by background, by temperament, by 30 plus years of professional backstory, I'm a historian. PhD, University of Wisconsin, more years ago than I'd like to admit. 20 plus years in university classrooms, five at the museum, working on my second million published words. This is a talk about a statue, but it's also a talk about that statue's historical context. Because in history, context always matters. The fiercest, bloodiest wars are those fought not over territory or over a throne, but over a way of life. The Thirty Years' War that soaked the blood of central, ground of Central Europe with blood in the 17th century. The Second World War, the Cold War. The Civil War was one such. The way of life at stake, make no mistake about this, was slavery. Lifetime, heritable, chattel, slavery and the ideology on which it rested, that men, women, and children of African blood could be property, like a cow or a horse, because, like a cow or a horse, they were not human. The battle over slavery, what Southern planters called our peculiar institution and Northern abolitionists called an affront to the laws of God and man, was decades old when the first cannonballs flew at Fort Sumter. It is not light we need, but fire, Frederick Douglass wrote in 1852. It is not the gentle shower, but the thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The question was put to the citizens of the Kansas, Kansas Territory in 1854. Enter the Union as a free state or a slave state. The first death came in December of 1855, and by the summer of 1856, armed guerrilla warfare had broken out across the state. Later that summer, in a Senate debate of the Kansas situation, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts accused Preston Brooks of South Carolina of embracing a mistress who, though ugly to others, is always lovely to him, though polluted in the sight of the world, is chaste in his sight. I mean the harlot slavery. Brooks, enraged, attacked Summer at his Senate desk the next day, beating him senseless with a walking stick. Censured, 
He was immediately re-elected by an overwhelming margin and hundreds of constituents in South Carolina and elsewhere below the Mason-Dixon line sent him replacement canes engraved, hit him again. Portrait of a chasm, portrait of a nation slowly tearing itself apart. The election of 1860 came, Lincoln won, and the southern states bolted, even before inauguration, con concluding that in, upon his inauguration in March, he would unleash the full fury of the abolitionists. The southern states declared, one after another, the principle for which they stood, the right to maintain and expand in the West the practice of chattel slavery. We know their reasons because the states and the confederacy into which they formed themselves declared them so in writing, boldly, clearly, and without equivocation. Soldiers on both sides committed their, who committed their thoughts to paper were equally clear about the causes of the war. Slavery, its future in America, and the future of America. And at this point, I should say, it's not the nature of oral discourse to accommodate footnotes. If anybody wants to see the version where I show my work, just shoot me an email or come see me at the museum and I'll show you the footnotes. Let me take a moment here to underscore two points. It's frequently said that those who fought for the Confederacy committed treason, but they did not. President Lincoln took the position that because the Constitution did not allow states to, to secede, the southern states had not, in reality, seceded. Having not seceded, they had not positioned themselves as a now foreign enemy, and those who gave them aid and comfort had not, therefore, committed treason against the United States. Make what you will of his legal argument. The fact remains that if the government against which you take up arms declines to indict you for treason, treason you have not, in fact, committed. It's also frequently said that not all those who fought for the Confederacy enslaved people benefited from the enslavement of others or even supported the idea of enslavement. True as this is at a superficial level, not all is a low bar to clear, most of all in large groups. It is also beside the point. Regardless of why they went, regardless of what they thought as they went, regardless of what was in their hearts, those who wore the uniform of the Confederacy and took up arms on its behalf, knowingly fought for a regime openly, explicitly, and in its declarations of secession, committed to the perpetuation and expansion of chattel slavery. The honor of the soldier may indeed be separable from the honor of the cause from, for which he or she fights. I'm a historian, not an ethicist or a moral philosopher. That's beyond my purview. But that simple historical fact, whatever your position on the ethics of the soldier and the cause, must, at the end of the day, be taken into account. The war ended and the Confederacy dissolved, but ideas don't fade away so quickly. The 13th and 14th Amendments outlawed slavery as an institution and explicitly extended the protection of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to all Americans regardless of race, creed, color, or prior condition of servitude. But saying it is one thing and enforcing it is another. The federal government did enforce it for, after a fashion for a decade or so after the war, but with the election of 1876, Google corrupt bargain, African Americans in the South were like the Kurds in the north of Iraq at the end of the Persian Gulf War, thrown summarily to the wolves. Fast forward 15 years. Cottage City, 1891. Charles Strahan, Maryland born, once a soldier in the 21st Virginia Infantry, now a citizen of Cottage City, publisher of the Martha's Vineyard Herald, is a stranger in a strange land, a southerner in a northern town at a time when sectional differences mattered more than they now do a wash ashore at a time when the vineyard was far more insular than it now is. Snubbed by the local chapter of the GAR, 
the Grand Army of the Republic, a Union Veterans Organization, when he expresses his intention to attend their Memorial Day picnic, he launches a campaign to erect a statue in their honor. Mark this, their honor, not the honor of the Union soldiers, not the honor of the GAR as a national organization, but the honor of the Henry Clay Wade post of the GAR. You guys, over there, the ones who were putting on the picnic last year. The statue and the original three plaques were a gesture by an individual toward a group of other identifiable individuals. The statue went up with a blank plaque on the fourth side of the pedestal and speeches were made. Someday, Strahan said and reiterated later in his newspaper, perhaps the men of the GAR would see fit to return the gesture of honor, respect, and the thing that Strahan clearly, achingly craved, acceptance. There are African Americans in Cottage City in 1891, bellmen and cooks, laundresses and landladies. Others come each summer to worship at the Methodist Tabernacle in the campground and the Baptist Tabernacle in the Highlands. They rent rooms in boarding houses or cottages from owners who care more about the color of their money than the color of their skin. The big resort hotels, by and large, will not serve them. Meanwhile, in the South, Jim Crow, legalized discrimination in defiance of the 14th Amendment, has solidified. Five years later, in Plessy v. Ferguson, the Supreme Court will, in effect, endorse it. Poll taxes, literacy tests, and open violent intimidation make the voting rights of African Americans a cruel joke. Enslavement has been reestablished in everything but name, in prisons and poor houses and sharecropped farms. Lynching on imaginary charges, or just for the sheer hell of it on a Saturday night, is epidemic. <laughs> Citizens of the New South, so-called nursing post-war wounded pride, desperate for northern investment in industries devastated by the war, craft a new narrative of that war known today as the lost cause myth. The antebellum South it holds was a genteel society of gallant men and demure women, think gone with the wind here, that was crushed by the North in a senseless war and a brutally harsh decade of reconstruction that followed. It was a quarrel between brothers over the proper balance of state and federal power. Can't the advocates of the lost cause asked, can't we all just be friends again? Can't we go back to being one nation? Fast forward almost a quarter of a century, Gettysburg, 1913, 50 years after the great battle, old men in blue and gray uniforms smelling of cedar and mothballs meet each other for what is billed as the last encampment. They sit around campfires, tell stories, and gripping one another's hands, declare the wounds of the war, psychological and otherwise, to be healed. Cameras flash, speeches are made, and the quarreling brothers of 1861 to 65 declare themselves reconciled. We are, they say, to each other and to the nation watching, all Americans again. African Americans might well have asked in 1913, what do you mean, we? And what do you mean, again? Two years later, 1915, D.W. Griffith brought the lost cause mythology to the screen in Birth of a Nation, a brilliantly cinematic and grotesquely racist caricature of the Civil War and Reconstruction. For those of you unfamiliar with it, this would be the one in which the Ku Klux Klan are the heroes. Six years later, 1919, President Woodrow Wilson would purge the federal civil service of African American employees. Two years after that, a white mob would attack the Greenwood District of Tulsa, a prosperous neighborhood of African American homes and businesses, with small arms and improvised bombs dropped from airplanes, burning it to the ground. A year after that, the Ku Klux Klan would reform at Stone Mountain, Georgia. Two, a year after that, the predominantly black town of Rosewood, Florida was torched 
again by a white mob. Two years after that, a plaque was added to the Soldiers Memorial in Oak Bluffs. Oak Bluffs, 1925, Charles Strahan is an old man, slowly dying. The members of the GAR, those still alive, are old too. My father, born in 1926, remembers one of the very last of them, Harry Costello, riding through the streets of Edgartown in an open car. His mother pointing and saying, look, Tony, you'll never see that again. That man fought in the Civil War. Prodded, uh, prodded by Sidney Eldridge of Vineyard Haven, a member of the GAR Women's Auxiliary, the surviving members of the Henry Clay Wade Post decide to give Strahan what he has wanted for so long. Acknowledgement, acceptance, a fourth plaque to replace the empty one he put on the pedestal half a lifetime before. There are more African Americans colored people in the language of the day, though depending on the speaker, that can mean anyone, Wampanoag, Portuguese, Cape Verdean, Azorean, mixed race, who happens to have dark skin. There are more colored people in Oak Bluffs now. Shearer Cottage is in its second decade, a mecca for black intellectuals, performers, and artists. The first generation of African American summer people, thank you, Richard Taylor, for disclosing their history. Um, have purchased, mostly in the Highlands, homes to which they return each summer. New Yorkers, like Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, Sr. of the Abyssinian Baptist Church, Bostonians like the Shearers and the Wests, are beginning to think of the vineyard as their second home, their home away from home, and a second generation, including a young Dorothy West and her cousin Helene Johnson, are learning what it means to grow up on the vineyard in the 1920s. Part of what it means is that the big resort hotels still have an unspoken color barrier. Part of what it means is that acting flashy or attracting undue attention is still, if you're black, problematic. Part of what it means is knowing that there are white people out there who won't eat at the homes of their friends who employ black cooks because they don't want to eat food that black hands have touched. Not everyone, not everywhere, not always, Oak Bluffs Mass is not Rosewood, Florida. But the invisible boundaries and the unmarked minefields are very much there. And every colored person in Oak Bluffs knows it. Sometimes the boundaries are visible. Blackface entertainment is still considered good fun on the vineyard in the 1920s. In 1922, the children of the, Oak, of the pardon me, West Tisbury School stage a minstrel show as a fundraiser. We have a ticket in the archives. If you went to the Ag Fair or the Vineyard Haven Library Children's Carnival in those days, there would be a booth where you could put down a few coins and get a stack of rubber balls with which to play hit the Negro, except that Negro would not be the word that was used. So, 1925, the plaques. One on the front of the pedestal, replacing an existing plaque, named Strahan for the first time in public, well, physically in public, as the donor of the statue, and acknowledged his service in Company B, 21st Virginia. The other on the rear, replacing a blank plaque, began, the chasm is closed. If you're here, likely you know the rest. And here is where wording matters. The statue in the first three plaques back in 1990 had been a gesture by one individual towards other individuals. Had Sidney Eldridge and those who made common cause with her in 1925 responded in the same register, we would not, I suspect, be here tonight. We can even imagine with the benefit of hindsight what such a response surely fully as gratifying to Charles Strahan might have looked like. This plaque is erected in honor of Charles Strahan by his brother veterans and by fellows and fellow citizens of the town of Oak Bluffs. But for reasons lost to history, they didn't do that. The fourth plaque donated by union veterans and patriotic citizens of Oak Bluffs in honor of the Confederate soldiers. 
universalized the sentiment. Caught up, perhaps, in the fading echoes of the last encampment a dozen years before. The architects of the fourth plaque reached for a sweeping statement of healing and reconciliation, one which they likely felt deeply and intensely. They were, after all, old men and approaching the ends of their lives and, if Christians, contemplating meeting their maker face to face and being called to account for how they treated their brothers on earth. but made such a statement at a time when, for African Americans in Oak Bluffs and elsewhere in the country, the chasm was far from closed, and the wounds inflicted not just in 1861 and 1865, but in decades since and centuries before, by the unholy alliance of power and prejudice were far from healed. Fast forward just briefly 30 more years. It's 1955. Brown versus Board of Education has been settled law for a year. In Atlanta, Birmingham, and elsewhere across the South, men and women whose names are not yet household words are gathering in the meeting rooms of black churches, making plans, getting ready. The storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake that Douglas called for a century earlier is coming again, this time by other means. Nationwide, the very last of the Civil War veterans are dying. Congress passes a bill enabling Confederate veterans to receive pensions and government-funded medical care. It's a symbolic gesture to perhaps a dozen now impossibly elderly men that will, within a year or two, be made moot by the inevitable passage of time. It does not, Facebook memes to the contrary, confer on those veterans or on other veterans retroactively some generalized and all-encompassing abstract status as U.S. veterans. Nor does an earlier law from the 1930s allowing the veterans of Confederate forces to be buried in U.S. military cemeteries. The last members of the GAR nationwide die in 1954, the last member on, on Martha's Vineyard, Harry Costello of the 4th of July Parade, died in the mid-1930s. The GAR officially passes out of existence and the final act of its final member is to transfer its symbolic flag to the sons of Union veterans of the Civil War, an ancestry society like the DAR and the Mayflower Society, founded in 1881. Like the DAR, membership in the SUVCW is contingent on the members' ancestors, not the members' military service. Fast forward 64 years, and here we are. Is the centuries-old chasm at last now finally closed? Are the wounds inflicted over those centuries finally healed? You doubtless have your thoughts, as I have mine. I invite you to consider that if your thoughts, or mine, are different from one another or from some third person's, it may be because having lived different lives, experienced different things, we see the world through very different, perhaps radically different eyes. Thank you for your time. Debate responsibly, and if you remember nothing else, remember this. History is complicated. Anyone who tells you different is selling something. I'm not sure. Can everybody hear me at this point? Right in the back there, I see head shaking. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of your efforts and, and coming here tonight to help uh, provide a whole lot of factual information. Thank you.
So next up would be um, Ms. Carrie Tankard, speaking on behalf of the NAACP. On this Tuesday, May 21st, we, the Martha's Vineyard NAACP, is resubmitting our solution to one, remove the fourth plaque from the Union statue, as well as the tablet on the ground which commemorates the placing of that plaque. Two, donate the plaques to the Martha's Vineyard Museum who have relayed that they are receptive to this donation. The statue is owned by Oak Bluffs and maintained by the Oak Bluffs Parks Department and is therefore under the jurisdiction of the Oak Bluff selectmen to decide this resolution. We encourage all voices to join in this discussion. We believe that to not decide is to decide. We honor all American veterans and recognize that there were Confederate soldiers in a war against American soldiers. We do not honor treason or those who fought to continue the institution of slavery. These are not the sentiments of one person. These are the demands of taxpaying citizens of Oak Bluffs to our elected officials from the NAACP. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. At the last few meetings, uh, at this meeting, you said that you wanted to stick to facts, and, and we've had a lot of meetings with a motion, so I'm going I'm to really try to do that. I'm going to stick to the facts. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Van Riper if he would be willing to answer this question. Um, what does the museum and or yourself feel should be done with the plaques, if you're willing to answer that question? So, yeah, so, um, Here you go. I'm Bonnie Stacey, I'm the chief curator of the museum, Hi. and um, we um, actually, uh, when this came up in April, I, I put in front of the collections <coughs> committee the question about whether we would be willing to accept the, the, um, the plaques into the collection, and if we were to do that, we would be responsible for them and we would interpret them with historical context, as Bo has mentioned, and they voted that we would be willing to do that. Excellent. Thank you. And, and of course, I was going to have a moment, but Bo took it from me, and I, he said it much more eloquently than I could. When last we <coughs> talked about the, the veterans said that they uh, were had equal status and that they were they were U.S. veterans, I took to the laws and I read them. I'm usually in the position of enforcing <laughs> laws, not interpreting them. So, but I interpreted it as just what he said. They it, it made it so widows could get $67 a month. Uh, the last person died like a year after the, the last one was enacted. It was symbolic. I didn't read anything in any of the laws that said that they were, uh, that they had valor or that they deserved purple hearts or bronze stars or anything like that. Uh, I read it merely as a way to give money to, to the descendants of the people that fought for the Confederate States. And it mentions that in the law itself, those who fought in the Confederate States. So it doesn't say that they're American soldiers. And the last thing is, I don't know if everybody knows this, it was brought to my attention recently, that in 2017, uh, on George's Island in Boston, Governor Baker had a Confederate memorial removed from there. That's where the prison was for the Confederate soldiers. Upwards of a thousand of them and 13 died. And there was a, a plaque put up by the Daughters of the Confederacy in 1963, of course, at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. And he had it removed. And if you allow me to put my glasses on. In 2017. And he said, Governor Baker believes we should refrain from the display of symbols, especially in our public parks that do not support liberty and equal, equal for the people of Massachusetts, his, his spokesperson said. So they've been boarded up and removed, and not one uh, veterans group protested, showed up, it's boarded up. It's, I believe right now they're trying to decide what to do with it. So um, there is a precedent for doing this, 
and we respectfully ask that you do that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, Carrie, thank you for speaking, and uh, Eric, th thank you very much. Um, just a couple of quick points before we enter into uh, the public comment portion of, of this hearing. Um, we would like to ask everyone to make sure that when it's time for them to speak, if they would like to speak, to please make their way to one of the microphones. Um, the person who is recognized at that microphone uh, is the person that is authorized to speak at that time. We would like to have people try to refrain from speaking over anyone else from the audience or anything like that. We'd like to attempt to maintain a respectful and uh, an open forum here. We have about an hour, so if you have new information you'd like to add, if, if you've spoken before and you have new information you'd like to add, um, that would be great. If you would like to share the time with folks who haven't had an opportunity to speak yet, um, that would also be appreciated. We'd like to hear from as many voices as possible. And uh, at the end of it, lastly, we're one town. We're an open and welcoming community. And uh, we're here tonight to have an open and honest and respectful, respectful discussion. Uh, regardless of what your potential personal position is. Um, and hopefully, you know, tomorrow when this is, has come to a decision, we'll all be able to go back to respecting and treating each other as we did prior to this point of conversation because there's certainly been some points that um, aren't the best or the highest or make me the proudest of where we've gone in this conversation. So hopefully we're able to maintain that type of decorum, respect everyone, and give people space to speak open and freely. So if someone would like to speak, please make your way to the microphones. And when it's time for you to speak, just please state your name, any affiliation you have with any organization you may be speaking on behalf of, as well as your place of residence. For the record, thank you. Very good. Sir. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to thank everybody for their participation tonight in coming and trying to make a uh, resolution to this uh, situation. <clears throat> My name is David Vanderhoop, Wampanoag Nation, Tribe of Aquina, Director of Sassafras Earth Education and Grandfather. I speak as an indigenous person to this island, Wampanoag territory for thousands of years. Our people have faced apocalyptic conditions. Along the eastern seaboard, 95% of the indigenous peoples were wiped out. I speak as a descendant of the surviving 5%. Alongside came enslavement of peoples from the African continent. Theft, exploitation, killing, and raping. Confederate armies were terrorists, instrumental in the oppression of people of color and native people. White soldiers used to celebrate their victories by kicking around my ancestors' severed heads and display their body parts on stakes. How would you all feel about that? How would you feel, white people, about having a Nazi statue with a swastika in your town, your place of vacation? Martha's Vineyard should not and does not stand for white male supremacy, the symbol of the Confederates. Nompi, a safe haven, stands for natural beauty, welcoming and inclusion, and the richness of a diverse population. Historically, Oak Bluffs, Ogeshkop, in my language, represents the resilience of a thriving black community, rich culture, and rich culture through generations. The Confederate white male supremacist paradigm is outdated and a lost cause. In the light of the current climate crisis, we need to be able to look each other in the eye and stand side by side, 
for the sake of our children, our grandchildren, and their children, and so on. When arriving in Oak Bluffs, I'd like to see a different memorial, one that represents all people and that honors Wampanoag people and people of color for their resilience. And this is just the first step in making reparations. The white people here that cannot see my point of view, I say to you, do your homework first. I hold up these ancestors here, documentation of what has happened. Do your homework and then see if you can still stand up against what you think now. Today I request the immediate removal of both the plaque and the statue in the name of my ancestors. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Hoop, sir. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Bob Sparks. I've lived in Edgartown for the past 42 years. Uh, I will make one disclosure to this crowd. I may be the only one in this room who attended a Ku Klux Klan rally in the American South in the 1960s. Before you judge, let me explain this. I was a student at Texas Christian University. I received a knock on my door late one evening, and a fellow I had seen around the campus asked me if I could come out and speak with him. He explained that, or he asked me if I wanted to attend a Klan rally, and I said, whoa, you got the wrong guy, fella. He said, no, I don't. I heard you in class today. When our professor, um, I was a grad, grad student at the time, taking a writing seminar, and a professor who had won the Pulitzer Prize for a biography of George Washington, I thought, this is a person I want to study under. And he started by asking each of us in the room to pick a great American that we can write about. And the fellow, somebody said Andrew Jackson, somebody said something else, and I said, Robert Kennedy. And he came down off the podium, bent down, looked me in the face, and said, I said, pick a great American, not a communist. And I said, are you kidding what Robert Kennedy has done for this country and civil rights and so forth? And he said, you better find another course. Well, that wasn't the only discrimination I witnessed. I was on my way to the hospital with a black fellow graduate student whose wife was going into labor. We were refused gasoline at a gas station. I saw people thrown out of restaurants because they didn't want to serve them. So I know what it is. And I was teaching at that time. I volunteered for a year teaching in an all-black segregated school. What I want to really talk about is, I got my PhD, came back, and I've been teaching history at Northeastern University in Boston for the past 36 years. My courses included the American Civil War, racism in America, coming to America about immigration. And I think I have wrestled with the question of race and slavery in American history. I gave a paper up at Pathways in Chomark one Friday evening a year ago titled, Our One and Only Failure. And I lauded the achievements of this great nation and yet said we've only failed in one regard. We still can't cross the color line. The color of somebody's skin still makes a difference in this country. Almost beyond belief, but so be it. The proudest day of my life was when my third son's third grade school teacher called me up and said, you're doing a remarkable job bringing up your son. And I said, why do you say that? And she said, the word prejudice came up in class today, and I asked anyone if they knew what it meant. Your son's hand went right up. And she said, what's prejudice? And he said, that's judging someone by the color of their skin and not the content of their character. And she said, where did you hear that? He said, my father teaches us about Martin Luther King, and that's what he said. As I started each one of my classes at Northeastern on slavery or African-American Boston, I bring in a newspaper from Charleston, South Carolina, 
And I have each one of the students come up and look and say, do you see anything interesting? And they always miss. Ships clearing the harbor that day coming in. And on this one day in Charleston, South Carolina, one port out of all of the 52 weeks of the year, and six ships came in with cargoes of Negroes from the Gold Coast. 350 on this ship to be sold at auction on Friday. 217 slaves on another ship. And I, it, it's a way of getting across to them the enormity of the African Holocaust. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kidnapped slaves being brought in <clears throat> to numerous ports up and down the American coast. But let me get to the point here. I'd like to follow up on something that uh, Mr. Van Ripper said. We must see things as they are. Nothing in American history has caused so much divide, so much death, so much discrimination, so much division as African slavery, 300 years of slavery, and then 100 years of uh, segregation, legal, sanctified by the Supreme Court, and now today the vestiges of it are alive everywhere in America. We'd like to thank, no, one of the first things that attracted me to Martha's Vineyard was red, white, and black seemed to be getting along like nowhere I had ever seen in America. And it was a wonderful place to come and buy a house and start a business. I'm not unmindful of the arguments of veterans. Two years ago, I was the keynote speaker at the memorial services in Vineyard Haven on Memorial Day <clears throat> because my uncle, who had been missing in action for 65 years, I had looked for him for 11 years, gone as far as Korea, and we finally matched the bones of 457 unidentified American soldiers who died in the Korean conflict with my DNA and brought him home to a tumultuous welcome. Uh, I wish my father had lived to see his little brother come home, but it was wonderful the closure it brought the family and veterans from all over New England, 2,000 of them, came to welcome my uncle home. So it means something to be a veteran. I tried to understand the question about the plaque, and I said, well, I'm a history professor. Well over 90% of men that fought for the Confederacy never owned a slave. All right, so still, they believe African Americans were inferior. So did Abraham Lincoln. His first response to the slavery question once war broke out was, the federal government should buy every single American slave at face value, whatever they were worth, and ship them back where they came from. Until some brave fugitive slaves, among them people like, excuse me, Frederick Douglass, who reminded, reminded the president that their families had been in America much longer than his. Why, don't, why doesn't he go back where he came from? And it's true enough. Slaves had been, been kidnapped and brought here from 1619 onward. So I've been studying the question of race and slavery in America for 42 years. <clears throat> I've had lots of friends that are veterans. I've tried to understand both sides. But I think in this case we have to see things as they are. No one has suffered more than African Americans in American society, a land of, of promise and freedom. But I think we all have to decide it would be a wonderful compromise if we could take those plaques down and give them to the historical society. Thank you. Somebody thank said you, keep thank it you, short. Thank you, Mr. Sparks. Really? <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank uh, you, Mr. Sparks. I appreciate your comments. Sir. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a summer resident. And Would you tell us who you are, sir? Yeah. In case there's uh, anybody here who doesn't know who you are. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, okay. I'm Dr. William McLaurin. I reside at 102 County Road, Oak Bluffs. And with regard to my Wampano brethren, I am a Washashua, as is most of you here today. You're all Washashuas. I rise because I'm fully committed to this 
Island in general and Oak Bluffs in particular. And I support the NAACP resolution. Now, there are two reasons why I'm committed to this island. The first is obvious, it's financial. I have a house that I bought in 2008. I, I pay taxes. I hire people like Brian Package when I had an addition to my house so he can make some money and other contractors can make money. I hire people to take care of my lawn. I am fine, and I'm also a member of Meek Meadows Golf Club. I am financially committed to Martha's Vineyard. Now there's another reason why I'm committed. And it's because personally and morally, I'm committed to this island and Oak Plus in particular. And let me explain. As a member of the Martha's Vineyard NAACP, when the high school had an issue concerning painting murals, vandalism, if you get my tone there, those of you who followed it, we went up, myself and others, to try to do all we could to help the high school. And we did that. And the high school said to me, Dr. McLaurin, would you help us when we, we're searching for a new guidance counselor, would you sit on the committee to get a new guidance counselor, search committee? I did it and I worked and I have a commitment to this place. Now when I, I'm here as a summer resident from May until November, and after that, I go back to Cambridge, where I, I retired from, Cambridge Ridge and Latin High School. I go back, this is as far, this is as far south as I'm going, okay? <laughs> I go back to Cambridge, and by the way, uh, as a, a former Cambridge resident, this wouldn't even come up in Cambridge. It would there would never be a vote like this in Cambridge. It wouldn't get that far. It would, it would have been gone. But let me get back to, to me going back to Cambridge and the significance of that. It's because I feel Cambridge is the kind of community that I want to be in. Whereas my colleagues and a lot of my friends leave at the summer and they go to Florida. No way would I contribute any of my resources to Florida. This is it. Okay, I come here and that's it. Now let me just end by saying this. Uh, let me, yeah, I know, Gretchen. <laughs> if at any time I felt in any way that you select me and the people here in Oak Bluffs would be Confederate sympathizers, I will tell you right now, all of you, 102 County Road would be up for sale. Leave, I can go back to Cambridge, George Wright Golf Club, Franklin Field Golf Club, the bodies even though there. And I can and go back there. Please, do not let us down. And don't let this be like your inaction around the Island Theater. Thank you, Mr. McLaren.
ma'am. Hi, my name is Nikki Patton, and I come from across the border, slightly south of here, West Tisbury. Um, I'm not going to go through my interest in uh, the civil rights issue, but I've, through my life somehow, it's woven. And someone said, I believe it was Gail Mar Barmakin, that said, let's stick to the facts. The problem is, is that racism is an emotional issue. There's no logic to it. There's no logic to saying someone of a different color is not worthy, is not okay, et cetera. So that being said, um, it is an emotional issue. And I have a short page <laughs> um, about this. Um, and David Vanderhoop already referred to this. There would be no debate about these plaques if the plaque said, let us close the chasm between World War II veterans and Nazi soldiers. Or a German who defected to the United States and then built a statue to American soldiers that said on the side he wanted to honor his old Nazi comrades. It's not Mr. Strahan's fault. He meant well. He wanted to honor the concept of the valiant soldier who fought in war, like we have valiant veterans here today. No matter which side they were on, no matter how misbegotten the concept they are fighting for may sometimes be. He wasn't even thinking about the concept of how justified the Confederate position was. No matter how valiant that soldier was, we cannot honor the concept that he stood for. It wasn't done then, but there are wars we will always remember for those who had no doubt about the justice and necessity of being the opposition. World War II was one of those wars. The Civil War was another one of those wars. We can't honor the soldier of, the, uh, of those wars no more than we could honor Attila the Hun. <laughs> and he's 1,500 years ago. We use him as an emblem of brutality. We're not going to build a statue to say, okay, we're doing fine with Mongolia now with putting him, putting him in the limelight. We just wouldn't do it because of the concept behind that soldiers. Those Confederate soldiers might have been conscripted. They might not have wanted to go to war. They might not have haven't even believed in slavery. But they stood for a concept for something that is unacceptable and, of course, is today. The Civil War... And World War II will, will always loom great in our memory because there was a right side. There's no doubt about that. Does anybody want to say the Nazi side was the right side of World War II? Does anybody want to say that the slavery side was the right side of the Civil War? Maybe there are some people in Florida who still do. I don't have a vote here. I'm a West Tisbury resident, and I'm not even one of your residents. I had to think about this, because I try to be balanced in my thoughts. What was the problem here? We were honoring a Union soldier. What was the problem? The war is 175 years gone. It's no longer history. It's no longer now. It's history. But it's not history. And even if it was, we can't support that opposition. I don't have a vote but I think you'd know which side I'm on. Take the plaques down, put them in a museum, and further, let's engender conversation about this. This is a complex issue. A man who was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to say, let's heal the wound. But what did that mean, healing the wound? Did it mean just saying, I forgive the people who fought in this war? I, I'm not quite sure. But what I'd like to ask that plaque be given with is what does this plaque mean in reality? Because obviously the war isn't over. Obviously the resolution hasn't been made. And obviously we are, I am thrilled to be in this room because we're all working on it. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Ms. Patton. Ma'am? Sorry? I was thanking Ms. Patton. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Coleman Walton. Uh, we live in Oak Bluffs. Uh, my grandmother first came here in the early 1900s as a guest of Julia Vanderhoop. She came to this island and fell in love with it. And in the t early in the early uh, 20s, she came back with her children and eventually bought a home in 1944 to the benefit of her five grandchildren who now come here. And this is home for us. Um, 
When we were kids growing up, we would talk about what a great place this was, and then someone would say, well, what about that Confederate statue over there? And we like, well, we'll just forget about that. That's just part of what is. And so I give credit to the NAACP for coming to the forefront and saying it's time. It's time for us to actually look at this. Um, I, I do hope that I speak for, uh, for all of the uh, African American families who have homes here, who vote here, who pay taxes here, but are not here tonight because they don't get here till Memorial Day, perhaps. Um, but I read a lot of the uh, letters to the editor in the different papers, and I was particularly struck by one letter written by Carla Cooper of Edgartown. And she said, and I, 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 I need to read this because I want you to feel this. As a white person, she says, I never have to think about my race. I never have to, it doesn't affect anything, any aspect of my life. I don't have to worry about how my whiteness affects my ability to get an education, to get a job, to get a bank loan, to buy a house, get a fair trial, or even do something as benign as drive my car. I don't have to go to court for the right to wear my hair in a natural manner. My whiteness has been an unearned privilege. This really struck me because I think so many people feel like they are benevolent and they are understanding and they are loving and kind and they yeah. accept their neighbor and what have you, no matter what color they are, but they don't walk in the shoes of the people who are not white. And they don't know what it feels like to look at a plaque that says the chasm is closed. I'm, I'll be 80 years old in June, on June 11th. The chasm has never closed for me. It hasn't closed for any, my prayer is that it will one day for my grandchildren, but they still have a hard way to walk. And all I want you to think about when you make your decision, forget the facts. Think about how this affects all of our African American, our Wampanoag, our people of color who know that the chasm is not closed. Think about that, please, when you decide to vote. My name, Walden, is, uh, sir. my name is Jim Tui. I live in Oak Bluffs. I'd like to make, or I'd like to be an advocate for veterans. I said I'd like to be an advocate for veterans. By 1864, there were over 300,000 African American soldiers in the Union Army. From 1864 to about nine months, actually for the first nine months of 1864, the policy of the Confederate government was that any African American soldier who was captured was to either be killed or returned to slavery. In September of 1864, Bedford Forrest, a general in the Confederate Army, captured 221 African-American soldiers. He and the men he commanded killed every single one of those African-American soldiers. Those soldiers are veterans. And the question I would put to you is do you think those veterans would be in favor of a plaque honoring Confederate soldiers. I doubt it. Thank you, Mr. Dooley. Sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Dick Cohen. I did speak uh, a month ago, but I do have new information. I've actually done some research. Um, I'm here again representing the Social Action Committee of the Martha's Vineyard Hebrew Center, which supports the NAACP petition to remove the two plaques, or I guess the plaque and the tablet. Uh, I'm also a resident of Oak Bluffs and a commercial and residential taxpayer. Well, Mr. Charles Strahan may have, in good faith, thought or wished 
that the chasm was closed and felt the need to honor his fellow Confederate soldiers. In reality, the chasm and the racism that gave rise to the Civil War was very much alive in 1891 and 1925, as you've heard. In the historical records around the placement of the plaques, most of which is on the town website, there's no mention of former slaves or other African Americans being included in the discussion, nor mention of the deep-seated racism that continued to pervade the South during these periods. Healing and reconcil reconciliation are certainly virtuous concepts, and while Strahan may have been well-intentioned, from a moral, humanitarian, historic perspective, how do you honor enemy soldiers who fought for and believed in an unjust and deplorable cause, slavery, right up there with genocide? Make no mistake about the cruelty, vehemence, and hostility of many Confederate soldiers toward freed American slaves during the war and thereafter. I think we just heard maybe this, the example that I have that I found, that in 1864, in what was known as the massacre at Fort Pillow, Confederate soldiers killed some 300 African American soldiers after they had surrendered. How do you honor such soldiers and declare the divide closed when after the Civil War and Reconstruction, nothing less than a state-sanctioned reign of terror emerged against blacks in the South, certainly encompassing 1891 and 1925, when the Jim Crow laws and racism were at its peak. Words and concepts such as reconciliation and soldier-to-soldier -soldier fraternity ring hollow when reprehens reprehensible acts against blacks in the South became and remain the norm. As noted by Dr. Van Riper in the town website, the war crushed the Southern Rebellion and slavery was abolished by the 13th Amendment, but sharecropping became slavery in all but name. The tools of racial subjugation remained in the vigorous and widespread use. The decades bracketing 1900, during which Union and Confederate veterans staged their well-intentioned ceremonies of reconciliation, brought Jim Crow laws, the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan, and the Supreme Court Plessy v. Ferguson decision, separate but equal. Not to mention, I would add, as others have, the horrific and persistent acts against blacks, lynchings, voter suppression, false accusations, unjustifiable incarcerations, and so on. Based on historical accounts, it could hardly be said that Confederate soldiers were not among the thousands of Southerners who supported and participated in the racial subjugation of blacks during the Jim Crow era. Again, how do we honor them then and now? That said, I do want to highlight a Martha's Vineyard Times letter to the editor by uh, Harry Seymour, who I don't know, but it was a well-reasoned letter. Mr. Seymour acknowledged the perceptions of current veterans and their supporters that the removal of the, of the plaques may cast dishonor on former con Confederate soldiers. Of course, given what I and others have mentioned, the plaque should not have been placed in the monuments in the first place. But as Mr. Seymour points out, the genie is now out of the bottle. Today, as so many have said, plaques are hurtful and continue to cause pain and anguish for African Americans, and as Mr. Seymour stated, possibly arousing fears of a return to the past. Mr. Seymour views the NAC's recommendation as a reasonable compromise. So does the Social Action Committee of the Hebrew Center. As Mr. Seymour put it, the plaque would remain in public view within a museum context, preserving its historical status that neither denigrates or dishonors those who support its sentiments. The action then removes a symbol perceived as offensive and hurtful by many island residents and possibly by hundreds of vacationers, thousands of vacationers, in fact. If anyone has been dishonored, it is, our, it is our fellow black citizens, both then by the placement of the plaques and now by the continued presence on the monument. They should be removed. Just two, two other thoughts. Uh, the reference to Charlie Baker uh, reminded me of another good Republican. There are good Republicans. <laughs> And that is uh, a former summer resident of, uh, uh, of Oak Bluffs, that's Ed, Senator Ed Brook. And, uh, and I think I know how he would stand uh, if he were here today. Um, you know, if I'm picking up the tenor of, 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 of what, what's, what's happening here today, um, uh, this is why I moved to Oak Bluffs as a permanent resident. I didn't maintain a house in Cambridge or Concord. This is where I am. <laughs> After 70 years of ties to Oak Bluffs, I came here because of the diversity, the inclusion, uh, the great feeling. Uh, I'm sensing it here today. I'm proud of that, and I hope that you all make us proud. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Commander Tom Rancic, United States Navy, retired. 
Lieutenant Commander Tom Rancich, United States Navy, retired, um, resident of Tisbury on island for, I don't know, 17 years or something. Um, sir, thank you for your admonishment. I, in fact, have done my homework, quite a bit of it. Uh, when I first started doing my homework, it was to keep my men alive in combat. Subsequent to that, I do my homework to keep myself alive by not putting a pistol in my mouth for the things that I've done. Ma'am. Ma'am, no one fought, no one fought for the Nazi army, they fought for the German army. Um, I learned that from history. I can tell you stories that will make you all cringe. I can tell you about the horrors of what humans do to each other. Not white men against black men, although that certainly happened. I can tell you about whole villages of people in Peru who had their feet cut off because we provided foot powder to get rid of ringworm and that offended the Sidera Luminoso. Um, so they went in after that and anybody with powder on their feet got their feet cut off Effectively, I was at war with the, with, with the drug lords to drive the prices of cocaine up in Los Angeles, which was pointed out by an assassin who was sent to kill me. Um, he didn't miss, he just decided I was a nice enough guy. Um, war is horrible. Humans are fallible. I have spent nearly 20 years after my last day in combat, nearly crippled, well, I am crippled. I'm nearly crippled to the point of being in a wheelchair. Nightmare, post-traumatic stress, wondering whether or not I made the right decisions, whether or not I could ever make anybody understand. And uh, I wanna thank you all, and I'm not being facetious, I'm not being trite, I'm not being quirky. Um, I am glad that my sons will never see what I saw. I'm glad that you will never see what I saw or do to other human beings what I did so that these forums could be held. And I think that those memorials ought to be removed. Thank you, Mr. Rancich. Sir? Yes, my name is Clennon King. I'm a seasonal visitor here on Martha's Vineyard. I think that Bowden Van Riper got it right. I watched his video probably about a month ago in its entirety. This is something that he recorded a year or two ago about this very issue. And there was one sentence that particularly resonated with me that I think is very, very relevant. And that is not sort of painting uh, what this war was all about, the Civil War was all about, and what uh, the role of the South had, me being a son of the South. He, he said something to the effect, the South seceded from the Union and had gone to war in defense of their right to maintain a society built on slavery and their citizens' right to practice murder, rape, kidnapping, and terrorism, unmolested by their own government, free from the touch of law, against what they regarded as an inferior race. Those are his words, not mine. That inferior race are my people. And so I take vigorous exception to anybody giving some credence about honoring this side that basically uh, did this to my people. The second point I wanna make is this whole notion about the veterans. There's a lot of reverence I'm feeling toward the veterans over these last couple of meetings. They haven't spoke at this point. But what I don't get is the lack of a careful read regarding what's on that plaque. It doesn't say just Union veterans. It says patriotic citizens of Martha's Vineyard. And the last time I checked, the word patriotic was defined out of Philadelphia. That we hold these, these truths to be self-evident that all men, not some, but all men are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights. 
And so I think we need to have a, an expanded view of the, what, what the meaning of patriotic citizens is. The third thing is this notion about messing with history. We don't want you to mess with the history. There's a, there's a history here, and we've got to re revere it. Well, the reality is that I think there's a lot of evidence where we, over time, have gone ahead and changed things for the right reasons. I mean, let's face it. It wasn't Virginia or Georgia or the Carolinas that was the first to legalize slavery. It was a Bay State. This was the first colony to do it. This whole madness that we're arguing about, this state, this colony, was the one to first commit that sin, that original sin. So we got a hand in this. This is a portrait of ourselves that we're holding up. Let's be real about that. And if that court or that legislature on Beacon Hill could make that decision in 1790, I don't understand why this selectman's board in 2019 can't make the right decision and change its mind for the right reason. The last thing is, is this. I am no fan. I am no fan of the Patriots organization. Not Mr. Belichick, not Mr. Brady, not Mr. Kraft, absolutely not. But there's one thing that I think is very relevant, and that is what Belichick has always said, and everybody here knows it, those three words, do your job. There's a moral imperative that each of you have that's got nothing to do with anything we said. All five of you had five mamas who taught you the right thing, to do the right thing. And so there's a moral imperative. Do the right thing and do your job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, my name is uh, Gretchen <clears throat> Tucker Underwood with a little sore throat. Uh, I am a, a, I'm the executive member of the NAACP and I support the resolution. But I'm a historian and I want to ask you a question, Mr. Von Reber, if I could. Is it accurate, you said that the, uh, um, there was no treason committed. Didn't the uh, Congress of the United States pardon all Confederate soldiers? And if so, what were they being pardoned for? and they were allowed to uh, keep their arms and return back to their lands. What were they being pardoned for, Mr. Van Reaper? Right. That's a very good question, and at this point I am going to engage in the historian's okay. oldest sidestep, which is, okay. that's not my specialty, let me get back to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've said that many, many times. Um, uh, there was a statement made about Nathan Bedford Forrest and the terrible massacre. I can't remember where that, where that was, but a footnote to that. It was Nathan Bedford Forrest who founded the Ku Klux Klan. So there was no doubt in the mind of Nathan Bedford Forrest about the worth or not worth of the black soldiers. And he had, not only did he massacre the soldiers at Fort Pillow, but he massacred, massacred them in the worst way possible to set examples for any other black soldier who would care to, to enlist. So that's, those are the two points I, I wanted to ask, uh, but I wanted to uh, remind you of a project in Wisconsin. You would appreciate this, Bo. Isn't that where you got your PhD? Um, a project called Reconciliation and Restorative Justice, and I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, and they have a project, and it begins with who suffered the most in this particular process? What can bring peace to this particular issue? And if it didn't intend to cause harm at that time, that's immaterial to the effect that it has today. So I would suggest to you, the ones that suffered the most are those who were not allowed at the table when this decision was being made. And I would hope that you would see that we are at the table now. Those plaques that were put up um, in 1925 We'll put up six years after this, and I will leave you a copy of this. This is an American soldier coming home from war in World War II in his uniform, being pulled from his military bus and lynched on the spot in his uniform. When we say things need to be changed, we know things need to be changed. 
There were soldiers who absolutely were against this. There were soldiers who fought for this country, and even when they came home, suffered lynching at the, at the hands in 1919. So our statue went up in 1925. It's not too incredibly uh, long a period of time for that to have happened. George Bush, you might remember him. George Bush had a quote which I would like to give to you at this time, and he said, a great nation doesn't hide in its history. It faces its flaws and corrects them. Oak Bluffs has a time now to display a positive change on making a better future, of acknowledging and understanding and reconciling what has happened. Maya Angelou, when we know better, we do better. We didn't know before. We walked by this statue how many times? When it came to our attention for a number of reasons, now we know. Everybody knows. There were, as I think we know today that there's press here from throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and maybe nationwide. We are on the microscope right now as to what are we going to do for the town of Oak Bluffs to make this better. The Confederacy to black Americans was a four-year aberration of Holocaust. That's what it was. The Confederacy lasted four years, and there is no reason for us to celebrate four years, but rather to, to celebrate 243 years of American history, where we all became Americans. We were not separated and we did not secede. Change at the Supreme Court brought me freedom, citizenship, and voting rights. Change is inevitable and not inherently bad. We need to make a change, members of the Select Committee. We need to make a change now before this gets any worse, before the hatred that you've all seen on all the network medias, before more hatred comes out, before we get another um, um, black eye. Oak Plus gets another black eye, because we have one now. And we say we knew better. Now that we know better, we will do better. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we're at 725. Um, and so you know, I'm certainly happy to go a little bit past 730 to give everybody a chance. But if we can just be mindful of that time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Power. I live in uh, Tisbury, Mass. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about my personal history. Um, I was a VISTA volunteer in North Carolina from 1968 to 70. The town where I worked had a um, billboard as you entered the sign Welcome to Fayetteville, this is Klan country. Um, while I was there, there's, there were firebombs, um, there were shootings, um, but the last thing that happened in 1970, a young black man who was 22 decided that he didn't want to work for 50 cents an hour anymore and for this white farmer picking cotton. So he got up, he said, I quit. He got up, started to walk off the fields. The farmer shot him. Uh, the farmer was charged with involuntary manslaughter and acquitted. White racism is deep in our culture. It isn't something recent. It's deep in Anglo-Saxon culture. The concepts of white and black affect us subconsciously. And racism is absurd because geneticists have proven we all came from Africa. Racism is so pernicious that you have to. It is morally important, morally um, necessary for you to remove these plaques. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ma'am? My name is Dr. Thelma Johnson. I am the president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, a life member and I am a life member of the NAACP. I have a very brief statement. I rise to support the removal of the plaques 
that are posted here in Oak Bluffs. And I think it would be a fantastic, fantastic, magnificent, outstanding, deliciously happy time if all of you would consider that since this is the 400th year of the commemoration of African American slavery, and we call it the perseverance of African Americans in the United States, what a great thing you can do when the five of you get together and you say, yes, we understand what happens when one of color asks you to do something that they really, we can't do it ourselves. The time is now to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Christine? Um, Christine Todd. I live in Oak Bluffs, Pentecook Ave. I've lived here about 20 years. I've uh, been very happy to raise two children here. Um, I confess reluctantly to being a white, privileged, and for most of my life, fairly ignorant person when it came to racism. Um, I thought it was all done. I thought it was all figured out a long time ago. And it wasn't until my son, who grew up in this wonderfully diverse town, uh, participating in the court uh, basketball program in Niantic Park, and then going on to be a counselor there, and then off to the Peace Corps after college. And he's now teaching in an inner city school in Brooklyn, two very underprivileged kids, mostly black. And he has started to send me literature over the course of his adult life pertaining specifically to racism, um, historically and now. And um, I have often been moved to tears over what I've read and ashamed that I had let myself live with such ignorance for so long. Um, I hope I can learn more and I really hope that this is an opportunity for us to have an amazingly powerful teaching moment in our town. With the cooperation of the museum, we have an opportunity to tell a story. Not just take the plaques down, but guide people to the museum where the full story can be told. And, and I think that we would be really missing the boat if we didn't take advantage of this moment in time to really broaden the reach of what we've all experienced in this room. So I hope you will consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Ma'am? Good afternoon. I want to say I appreciate your indulgence this afternoon. Selectman, I appreciate your indulgence this afternoon. Um, my name is Marie Allen. I was married on the vineyard in 1950. My daughter was married here. I have been subjected to racism and bigotry on the island, as have my grandchildren. However, I am retired here, happily retired here, and we still have racism and bigotry that we must fight. I am also the past president of the Martha's Vineyard NAACP. The Confederates of the United States, thank you. It's okay. okay. All right. The Confederates of the United States had a solid military tradition with strong soldiers and commanders who believed in preserving slavery and white supremacy. History reveals the Confederate States stood for disunion of the United States and for an official establishment of slavery. Now, we can't change history but we can refute it in a very small way by removing the Confederate 
plaques from the Union statue in Oak Bluffs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Who's the last person in line? Is that, is that Elaine? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna cap conversation, uh, public comment with Elaine, just in the name of time. Ma'am? Uh, my name is Felicity Russell. I'm from West Tisbury. I don't see how what I wanted can be done because I looked at the statue and I wanted to keep our dirty linen in public and then have a rededication in 2020 that talked and addressed the things we've all been talking about now. I feel our shame is public. Um, I don't see how we can do that in a practical way, so I support the next best thing from my point of view, which is having the plaques removed and the story in the museum. But I just feel that the story is in the public park right there when people get off the boat. So that's, that's all. I couldn't figure out how to do it, and that's not on the agenda tonight. That's all. Thank you. My name is Reverend Bob Barnett. I'm a pastor in Edgartown and Oak Bluffs. I'm, I live in Oak Bluffs. Um, I'm a veteran. Um, I'm speaking as a veteran, but not on behalf of the veterans organization because their veterans are on different sides of this issue. Um, I also grew up as a southerner during the, the height of the civil rights movement in Louisiana where, where racism was very, very strong. And I recognize the symbolism of a Confederate flag or the, the mention of the Confederacy as being very egregious. It bothers me a little, but as a white person, it didn't. Um, I, I don't have the same reaction that an African American would have. As I said a couple of meetings ago, that I, I have not walked in the shoes of an African American, and therefore I can't really begin to understand fully the, uh, the implications of this. At the same time, as a, as a veteran, there's a, a unique um, position that we have toward those who have, uh, have been our foes. In, on uh, Pearl Harbor Day, um, even now, Japanese pilots will come and shake hands with uh, survivors of Pearl Harbor, and the animosity is gone, uh, much like the uh, Gettysburg, uh, uh, 1913 Gettysburg uh, reconciliation. Um, the, as a young Army officer, I had learned, um, well, I, I, I was at the, the point of time whenever the whenever the military was beginning to work through many of its racial issues and some of the people that would, such as Colin Powell, that would rise to the top were already in command in units. I had mentioned before that I had a brigade commander who was from Harlem. Um, I remember mostly uh, the eagle that he wore on his cap because he was far superior to me and then when he came in to talk to me, I'd better pay attention. The fact that he was black was secondary. I mean, it certainly was important, but we had learned, and I think this is probably true with every veteran here, we had learned to work with people of color probably much sooner than most of the people um, in America because we were doing it uh, beginning in the 40s and we were learning to, to deal with people by the content of their character by their, and in the military by their rank rather than their color. So. It, it's a different perspective that a veteran might have than, than what you may think if you've never put on, put on a uniform. Now, personally, I'd like to see something akin to what the lady uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, before me. Um, I hate to see that the history be put away in a museum that 
people may or may not come. I have no idea how many visitors actually come to the museum. What I'd rather see is the plaque be replaced and the wording be exactly as it should have been, as our historian said, honoring a person, not the Confederacy, and maybe not even using the word honor, but acknowledging. And I'd like to see the story, uh, the story told there as people come off the boat, uh, as people um, come in, that there could be panels or, or um, storyboards to tell the whole story that goes from, from slavery in Massachusetts all the way to the fact that we had an African American serve as president and choose to make Martha's Vineyard his, his place of vacation. That being said, that's not my main concern. My main concern is the, what seems to be the animosity between the two sides. You know, the, sometimes we hear that there are, that the veterans are racist, although I haven't heard that from the NAACP directly, but we hear that or we read that in the paper. We, we um, read that the selectmen have not the moral courage to do what is right. Um, and I'm concerned about that, uh, partly because I believe as a Christian pastor that the, the ultimate problem with us is even deeper than racism. Racism, racism is, is ugly, and uh, one author called it the America's original sin. However, deeply inside is our own sinfulness, and if we can't learn to get along and work together, then, then this divide would continue. And so I would urge us just to step back and try to see things from the other person's side, um, at least become knowledgeable, become friends. It doesn't mean that we necessarily change views, but to not label one another as, as racist or people who want to destroy history or however we want to do, but, but learn to come together. If we can't do that on Martha's Vineyard, you know, then we can't be an example to a nation that needs to see us working together. So. Thank you, sir, ma'am. Hi, my name's Jill Delahunt. I'm from West Tisbury. Can you hear me? Delahunt? Yeah, Delahunt. Louder? I have a soft voice, plus I'm nervous. History matters for context, and tonight will become part of the history of this island. As a white person, I want the history of tonight to be on the side of clear scene, humbleness, and moral justice. Those of us who are white must start listening. We must start owning our history. Listen to the, I, the voices of the first people of this island. Listen to the voices of the African-American residents of this island. Give those plaques to the museum. I'd do more. I'd take down the statue. I like David's idea. But I think that a very generous compromise has been offered here. So take down those plaques, give them to the museum, look how we can put them in context, look how we can create dialogue, conversations, not only about the history of Native American genocide, of racism, of nationalism and xenophobia, of anti-Semitism, but it all goes on now. It's not history. So let's create something to allow us to really look at that, talk with each other. Let's do it. Be on the right side of this. That chasm is the chasm of systemic white supremacy. And the first thing that we can do to begin to bring a close to it is to listen and do the right thing. Sir? My name is Russell Ashton, and I'm from Oak Bluffs. I'm from Massachusetts. I went to school here, but let me tell you, you opened the covers tonight. This was a history lesson that will never be forgotten. I am proud and excited to be here. I think this is something that the working with the museum, the selectmen, uh, we can write the book that will tell the story of Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts, if you give it the chance. Uh, I want to make this short and sweet because it, uh, that's, that's what the essence of tonight is. Go home, be happy. We should have had all the children of Oak Bluffs in the room 
to hear the story. Um, the only thing I can say is I hope the family of Oak Bluffs have given you the power to do the right thing to let the story and the history be told. Thank you. Thank Can you, you hear Ashton. me? Is that okay? All right. Oh. <laughs> well, for the next 45 minutes. My name is Elaine Weintraub. I am, among other things, an Irish woman who is the co-founder of the African American Heritage Trail in Martha's Vineyard and who employs people to work in Oak Bluffs. I love Oak Bluffs. It was my first teaching job on the island. I've been involved with that, this town for 30 years. And this is how I feel. I'm not going to address the history. I have a doctorate in African American history, but the history has been really adequately addressed from lots of people. I'm going to address the pain which I have seen visibly all around me all evening. When people describe the atrocities that constitute African American history, they go through those years, culminating in 1925 when the whole nation received Confederate monuments to establish white supremacy. That was the height of persecution of African-American people. Now, I can say that, and I can sit in college rooms, and I may identify a little bit as an Irish woman and say, yeah, I get that, because we were colonized people. But I look around me, and I see when those things are mentioned, the pain that crosses people's face. These are our citizens. This is the community of Oak Bluffs. You have to do the right thing. How can we possibly not address that pain? How can we not make the leap of saying, I don't feel that right now, but I see your pain, and I don't want to keep my neighbors in pain. The museum option is a great one. People do go to the museum. It's free every Tuesday. <laughs> they do go, and they see history there, all kinds of history. That's where history belongs. And it would be contextualized there. So you'd say this was put up in 1925, and this was what it may have meant. We don't know. We don't know everything that was in Charles Strand's heart, but we do know what's in the heart of our neighbors here tonight. So I appeal to you, take the plaques and put them in the museum. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, at this point, everybody's had a chance to speak. I didn't see anybody else making their way. If there's no burning desire to get to the microphone, I'd like to, at this point, close the public comment and uh, let the board begin to discuss a variety of options that we have in front of us. Excuse me, everybody. We need to be able to have a discussion up here, so if you could please keep your commentary down so that we could have a talk. This is a public deliberation. Thank you. Um, I, Gail had a question that she wanted to ask. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, one, I wasn't sure what you said. That, was there any definitive conclusion about the chasm is closed, what the meaning was? Because I've seen some of your writing before in this, and there may be different interpretations of it. My understanding from a prior reading, I think, was that it could possibly mean between Union and Confederate soldiers in that historical context. And if you don't, you know, if there's no answer, there's no answer. I think it's a reasonable 
interpretation that what the people who put up that plaque in 1925 meant was the chasm between Union and Confederate soldiers. It is also true that in my remarks tonight, I was deliberately using the phrase, the word chasm to describe a much broader, deeper, fundamental chasm that divides American culture and has since well before 1861. But if you're asking about the plaque... I'm asking about the plaque. Um, then, yes, okay. I think it's reasonable to assume that they meant what the people at Gettysburg and 13 and I don't know if you covered this before again or tonight. Grand Army of the Republic were predominantly, if not exclusively, Union soldiers they originally. Were by definition, Union soldiers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions, Jason? Any comments you'd like to make? Uh, do you want to go through? Uh, well, we have a variety of options here in front of us, but I think that um, Greg and we have a variety of options here in front of us, but I think that uh, I have Greg and Michael who are both interested in, in making a motion. I just want to make sure that everybody on the board, if they have any, anything they'd like to add prior to any motions being made, um, that they have a chance to speak. We can still discuss it. Yeah, have yeah, we can discuss Certainly. I do have so we have a variety of options on the table. We have one, which is the NAACP request. We have two, which is, these are just what we've heard over a variety of meetings and correspondence. Uh, which is remove the statue and the plaques, uh, which is make no changes. Uh, item four, make no changes to the statue and the plaques, add an informational educational uh, signage about the statue and Oak Bluff's history and the current state of our town. Uh, five, which is remove the plaques and add an educational signage. Six, which is place a ballot question April 2020 for town vote. So those are just the, the various options, but if Michael or Greg have something they'd like to... Six, which is place a ballot question April 2020 for a town vote, which I don't think that's something that's currently on the table. Greg? Okay. Um, I would like to, probably a couple of parts to the motion. I'd like to make a motion that we remove the two plaques. And in addition to that, I would personally love to see Mr. Ben Riper our chief, Joanne Murphy from the Veterans, work together to maybe replace that with something that explains either what went on here tonight or the history of the, of the statue. But I do, uh, the first part of the motion would be to, to remove the two plaques and then replace it with history. The two plaques, of course, would go to the museum for, for a certain cost. I will, uh, I'd like to second that motion. So now that the motion is second and we can discuss this, discussion. because I'd like to really expound on Greg's idea, which is one of my ideas, is that um, should the plaques be removed, um, whether we give it to the, or donate it to the um, museum, or we can also donate it to the museum in trust. So... Um, that way there's, there's, more, there's more participation maybe from an outside. I was thinking of the veterans working with the museum in terms of whatever historical explanation they come up with on the plaque. So, I mean, that, that was my purpose of it. So um, I don't know if Joanne is here, if they can work together on that. She mentioned everything. I just, yeah, I just want to, let's listen to Joanne if you don't mind first. I'd be glad to work with Mr. Van Riper because even though we feel that they are veterans, um, I, I listened very carefully tonight and we need to close this. We need to make things right between all parties. So I would be willing to work with anybody, Mr. Van River, the NAACP, to put something else in that place that everybody can agree on. Okay. Uh, all parties working together, yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, just in case the, the point got missed, I think that Greg's motion was inclusive of all parties, <clears throat> whether it's um, Wampanoag, whether it is NAACP, whether it's um, the veterans group, town agents, um, it's, it would be a representation. Obviously, this is a statement of inclusion, um, so it would seem kind of silly if we were going to leave anybody out of that conversation at the end. There seem to be some concerns and questions coming from the audience around that, so I just want to clarify that point. So, Greg? Just in thinking about it, I think the first thing we should do is take the plaques, then work on this group. And again, my, uh, you explained it. Um, my motion was inclusive of everybody. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. Uh, I would just like to say, you know, I've come a long way in this process. Uh, in the beginning, um, I think the NAACP could have done a better job in creating a forum. And, and this was a great forum tonight. I think this should have taken place before you demanded it come to the selectmen and, you know, demand that we take the plaques down because there was a lot of misunderstanding. So I think if this ever comes to the future, I think we need to do to do more of this. But I know as, as we met, um, I, I grew and I understood and, and tonight was, you know, I, I think I had my mind made up before, but this forum tonight was very, very educating and I want to thank everyone for coming. It took a lot of bravery, Mr. Vanderhoop, for you to stand up, especially with, with your, your organization, everyone here tonight. So I want to recognize and thank everyone. I started um, the last meeting that this was at by saying that I'm a veteran. And I understood the plaque, the way it was written, the way I heard it, okay? And that's the way I heard it. That's not necessarily the way I feel today. I said that I was open-minded and I was gonna try to stay open-minded. Um, and I'm just gonna hit a couple key points really quickly. Uh, there was a knee-jerk reaction uh, when this first came out uh, by a lot of people to say, absolutely not, you're not touching our town, leave it alone. Um, you know, you may only come here, you know, for the summer. The, um, the threats of, of losing money uh, were definitely, um, I don't think we were worried about the money so much as much as the threats. So in saying all of that, I have kept an open mind. I, I went and had coffee with somebody afterwards because I wanted to understand a little bit better um, what we were talking about from a different perspective. Um, I have kept an open mind. I do believe that we should do the right thing, um, and that includes everything that was, was discussed in the, uh, the motion tonight. So let's move forward. I'd say the only thing you probably want to hear from me is to call a vote, I'd imagine. <laughs> <laughs> we have a second, Michael. Greg, could you please repeat your motion? And then we can vote. We have a second, which is Michael Santoro. Okay. The motion was that we... Um, no, 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 I'm just trying to not put too much work on the park department. That we remove the two plaques, I was going to say immediately, but in, in a reasonable amount of time. That we remove the two... Shush. Remove the two plaques when as soon as the park department can do that. And then we work with the, the, the groups that I mentioned, the museum, the NAACP. A committee to be made, including... Yeah, including, including veterans, including Native Americans, so that they can tell the story of this, the, including the removal of the plaque and why and where we've come. And we have a... Is that direction enough for the museum? Yeah, we'll be okay. Yeah. Okay, and we have a second from uh, Michael Santoro. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So, the motion passes. All right!